go back to the beginning I can't control what tomorrow will bring But I know here in the middle Is the place where you promise to be you come, will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? you come
Good morning and welcome to St. George. Happy Sunday. All right, we're happy to have everybody here. If you're here for the first time, we welcome you. We're thankful to have you. I'm Keith Earl, Senior Director here at St. George. And we're gonna get started with our morning prayer worship today. If you need a bulletin, we have QR codes in the back on the bulletin board. You can scan that with your phone or follow along on the screen so we have everything you need right there. If you have children in worship today, we are gonna do Children's Chapel. Miss Happy's in the back, raise your hand, Miss Happy. And the children can head on out at this time and join Miss Happy in the back. And we are ready to start. We have Roy Thompson, one of our le lems, here to help us this morning. Thank you, Roy, for leading, let's go. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. All together, kneeling, let's confess our sins. Together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let's join together in singing our first song. Will you please stand? It's Reckless Love.
Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalm 52, it's on page 657 of the Book of Common Prayer or on the screen. We will read the psalm in unison. You tyrant, why do you boast of wickedness against the godly all day long? You plot ruin, your tongue is like a sharpened razor, O worker of deception. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking the truth. You love words that hurt, O oh, you deceitful tongue. O oh, that God would demolish you and utterly, topple you and snatch you from your dwelling, and root you out of the land of the living. The righteous shall see and tremble, and they shall laugh at him, saying, This is the one who did not take God for a refuge, but trusted in the great book and rely upon wickedness. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in mercy of God forever and ever. I will give you thanks for what you have done and declare the goodness of your name in the presence of the God. A reading from Amos. This is what the Lord showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, that you trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will a new moon be over us so that we may sell again, and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who lives in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? On that day, says the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. And I will make it like mourning for an only son 
and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will sell famine, send famine on the land, not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but of hearing the words of God. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and join together in hymn 488, Be Thou My Vision. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better, which will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. You may be seated. I'm, I could make you stand the whole time, <laughs> which y'all couldn't see on Facebook, but would be funny to me. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I am glad to be with y'all again. Thank you. I'm excited to be here to this morning. So I want to share something about myself with y'all this morning. So most of my entire life, from childhood on, I have been a horrible, horrible sleeper. And really, just basically an insomniac since childhood on. And I just, really, I still apologize to my parents for this. And so early on, they tried to figure out ways to help me be a better sleeper. And so then I started coming up with ways that would help me and so they, I think they were just at the end of their ropes. They're like, fine, whatever, Taylor. Whatever will help you, we will get for you. Um, so when I was five, I convinced my parents that I needed finches. 
Right, the birds. <laughs> the birds. And so I got, my parents got me these birds in a little cage because I said, oh, their, their tweeting will help me sleep. So this lasted about two weeks, I think. And then I got in my five-year-old head, I need to let these birds free in my home. Um, parents weren't thrilled about that. I think eventually they just opened a window and they were like, freedom. Because um, I just have this vivid memory of my mom like running around with a pillowcase. It wasn't great. I later on convinced my parents that I needed the radio. I needed music to help me sleep. And this was in the time of, you know, the 80s. And any of you young people out there listening, the late 1900s, correct. <laughs> That's now what it's referred to, it's terrifying. Um, but this was also the time that Whitney Houston had her hit song, Didn't We Almost Have It All. So anytime that song came on, I came out and I said, Mom, didn't we almost have it all? And she said, you don't even know what that means, go to bed. So the radio eventually also went away. Um, so we tried, we tried all of these things. Eventually they were just like, can you read a book? Can you just read a book, please? Um, later on I found one of the keys that helped me sleep and it was quizzes. Now, not school related quizzes, not math quizzes, never math quizzes, <laughs> never math. But quizzes like about myself, to find deep truths about myself. And these quizzes were things like, what kind of potato are you? <laughs> I'm a curly fry. <laughs> yeah. Or, are you really Southern? Oh, yes, I am. Y'all, <laughs> I am. Um, or, you know, what kind of animal are you? I'm a sloth. <laughs> that tracks, still, as an adult. I'm like, I'm going to take a nap. Um, now, these quizzes are ridiculous. I still take them when I can't sleep. I'm like, oh, all these little quizzes. But they don't really reveal deep truths about yourself. They're ridiculous. Like, what color is your aura or whatever? Like, they don't mean anything. Um, but we all kind of want to find out more about ourselves, right? We want to find out these deep <coughs> things about ourselves. So we take potato quizzes or whatever they are. Um, and I don't think I'm alone in this because you can look, if those of you who have Facebook, you know, you are on Facebook, you have, and you can look and see all these people take these quizzes on your feed. And then for some, of, for some people, you know, about a day later, they say, don't answer my Facebook Messenger app. I've been hacked. So <laughs> be careful when you do these. But there are actually research-based quizzes that you can take. There are actually tests that can, that can help reveal aspects of your personality. You've probably heard of things like Myers-Briggs, or they're ENFJ, or INTJ, all these different letters. Um, but some of you may have heard of like the Enneagram. Anybody heard of that? Wonderful. If you haven't, we're gonna nerd out for a minute. Just a minute, it won't be too long. But the Enneagram is this personality typing tool, basically. And so it breaks down patterns of human behavior into nine distinct types. And each type has a specific kind of motivation, basic fears, um, things that, coping strategies, things like that about yourself. Now you can take a test and sometimes it'll ask you weird questions, but then you get a number. And each number correlates kind of to your type. And so there's type one, which is a reformer, two, you're a helper, three, you're an achiever, four, an individualist, Five, you're an investigator. Six, you're a loyalist. Seven, you're an enthusiast. Eight, you're a challenger. And nine, you're a peacemaker. And so each of these nine types are nine different ways of seeing the world and how the world works with you and around you. Um, it doesn't just teach you about your strengths, but maybe some of your blind spots and maybe a little of your weaknesses. And it helps you reflect on yourself, on your lives. And also it helps you understand others and how you can maybe communicate with others a little better and it's really gives you kind of practical insight. And I know some of you are now thinking that I'm about to sell you some sort of timeshare in Florida. <laughs> and I'm not, don't worry. It's actually in Colorado and for the low, low price of, I'm just kidding, it's not like that. While no personality test is 100% accurate, I'm never saying that, um, 
it actually is empirically researched. And there's even qualitative and quantitative studies that talk about its benefit for personal and spiritual growth, emotional benefits, all of these things. I mean, I even use it in my counseling work. It's something that can be helpful. And again, not 100%, like we're not ever saying those things. So, some of y'all probably think, great, what does this have to do with Mary and Martha? Can we, can we get to it? Like, where are we going with this? Thank you, you are probably a type five, an investigator. <laughs> get moving, lady. Now, using various perspectives and tools to digest and view people and characters from scripture can be really helpful in deeper understandings of stories and their meanings. We have different tools to understand what scripture is trying to tell us. And let's take today's gospel story. Let's take Mary and Martha, because often these two women are viewed very one-dimensionally. We hear these different sermons, these different writings about these women, and we get Mary, who is just calm, contemplative, go with the flow, kind of just like, oh, at the feet of Jesus. Her hair is very flowy. She's very flowy. Oh. And then we have Martha. She's doing it all. She's handling business. She's a super woman. That's kind of all we get. That's really all we get. But, take a sip of water. But is Martha really this high-functioning superwoman? Or, I'm going to quote this directly from the Enneagram website, the Institute. Is she just this reliable, hardworking, responsible troubleshooter who foresees problems, but then can become defensive, evasive, and anxious, running on stress while complaining about it? Is Martha really just a six on the Enneagram, the loyalist, who's been pushed to her limit by her seemingly slacker sister? Maybe. Well, let's, let's look at it. First, Martha has welcomed Jesus into her home. The framework for this whole story is hospitality. Hospitality then and now is an important cultural norm in this region. And... It's also a mark of the early church that followed after Jesus. Jesus comes into Martha's home, and she starts busying herself with providing appropriate food and drinks for her guest. It's a big deal. It's not just someone stopping by and like, hey, well, I have some pita chips. Good? Like, it's not a casual thing. It is a big deal. And as she's doing all of these things, she is handling business. She notices that her sister Mary just sits down on the floor at the feet of Jesus and listens to what Jesus has to say. This annoys Martha, that Mary isn't helping her in the kitchen. And we can, like, at least I sort of imagined that Martha is in the kitchen just sort of passively, aggressively, like, banging pots. <laughs> like, yes, you can hear me working, Mary. Stirring aggressively, making sounds, like not saying a word, but just like, <sighs> great. Because Martha has a lot on her plate. She's taken in guests, plural, and hospitality is a big deal. Martha feels like she has so much, do, all this work to do on her own. Take all this hospitality burden on her own. And she is done being the loyal, responsible, anxious, overworked one. And she takes action. But what kind of action does she take? This is where I think we really get to like the heart of this passion. I mean, the heart of this passage is that Martha never asked Mary to help her. She doesn't ask Mary to help her. She actually goes to Jesus. She triangulates and goes to Jesus. Doesn't say, hey, Mary, I could really use a hand. Come on. 
She goes right to Jesus, strangulate, and says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Huh. Another thing we need to notice about Mary's complaint to Jesus in the triangulation is that she refers to herself several times. My sister has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Me, me, me. In the frustration to get all these things done, Martha's generous hospitality has become more about her than about her guests. So Jesus, and the wonderful ways that Jesus really just sort of gets to the heart of all matters, says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. Jesus is not saying this because Martha is too busy or Martha shouldn't be doing things because she is a woman, which is sometimes what people say, right? Well, she's a woman, she shouldn't be doing things. That's not it at all. But he is saying that Martha is needlessly distracted and anxious and is not what she's really needing to be doing. She is distracted and anxious and has lost the point of the hospitality. If Martha really was a six on the Enneagram and she needs to have her security and to feel need, needs to be supported by others, this feedback is probably a little rough. Like, ooh, what? Ooh, oh, itchy. That she thought of all the scenarios, except for this one, <sighs> She thought of all the meals, all the drinks, all the things, but it was in all the doing too much that she allowed her distraction to allow for disconnection. In all the things and all the doing too much, she forgot to connect with the people she was being hospitable to. It wasn't the busyness, it was the disconnection. Now, I can really empathize with Martha because Another truth about me is that I am a six on the Enneagram. I tend to live in a constant state of needing to plan every outcome, even the catastrophic ones. And those who work with me are probably laughing um, because they're like, yes, yeah, she does. <laughs> um, so when I do have people over, I make sure there are at least four drink options, four snack options. Each crock pot is ready to go. Um, the playlist is awesome. Everyone has refills. If we're using the pool, there's towels. The candles are not near anything flammable. <laughs> Never. I'm constantly checking those. Everyone has bug spray, sunscreen. Um, I mean, the list goes on. I am ready. Until I have to stop and realize I have not even talked to anyone that's there. Everyone is talking. And I'm like, I, have I even said hello? I have not connected because I am too busy being distracted by the stuff. I'm not even being hospitable because I am too busy being distracted. I am being Martha. I'm not even being hospitable anymore. Being present with people authentically is what's of value, not going over how many bags of Tostitos I still have left for the queso that's in the crock pot, and is it on medium, Oh no, I left it on high. But this distractedness that Jesus calls Martha out for is not just for people like me, it's for all of us. We all have focus and attention issues because all of us live in this distracted age. The amount of information that is available to us is far more than we can absorb at one time. It's like trying to take a drink out of a fire hose. It is just so much. We have this impaired multitasking. Have you ever noticed how many times, like maybe, and it's, it's been us and we've had to do it, where we've been at a stoplight, the light turns green, and the person in front of you is not going, or maybe you're the person that's not going, and you kind of have to honk, and then they go, and then you look over, it's because they were on the phone, probably sending that last text or the last email. 
because we're trying to multitask. It's, we can't really. Or the belief that we can do it all, right? We can do it all. But in reality, we only have so much energy. We only have so much energy in our batteries that we have to start making tough choices, choices that impact our personal and our family time. We can't multitask connectional relationships, not really. Another place that's distracting is this 24 seven, like news cycling, right? We're always having to be looking and it's on. The quantity of news has really lowered the quality and the accuracy of the information we get because it's all the time. Then causes our focus to move to places that are unhelpful to our emotional and mental health. And we become overloaded and struggle to get out of the quantity versus quality cycle. And this distractedness can even have a huge Im impact on our spiritual lives. When we are distracted by information and events outside of ourselves, it prevents us from fully developing an interior spiritual life, which factors in our faith development and spiritual maturity. It's hard to even sometimes connect in worship when we are distracted. If, like Martha, we are so preoccupied, we remove ourselves from the here and the now and sometimes live in these places of future anxiety, that it makes it hard to have these connectional, worshipful experiences. And I feel that when I'm here sometimes at work and I feel like, okay, well, I gotta do this and I have to connect here and I have to run here, run here. It's hard to feel worshipful. It's really difficult. And finally, the real activity to which God calls us is this important work of loving as Jesus loves can only be sustained when we draw ourselves into the presence of God. There's a real kind of frenetic activism that can lend us to burnout and bitterness when we feel like, we have to do all the things, all the things, all the things, all the things. And we sometimes miss out to what God is discerning for us to do. How do we go out and be the hands and feet of God? And sometimes even the church is often too guilty of valuing busyness over focus. Now, the word translated today as better, as in Mary has chosen the better part, can also be translated into good. It's not that Martha has chosen wrongly and Mary has chosen rightly, but that Jesus is with them here and now. And what is called is for attention to focus on him, to focus on the here and the now which means we don't have to choose between doing, we don't have to choose between the doing and the contemplation. We don't have to make those choices, but we do have to choose balance and figure out ways that we can find balance that makes us feel whole and free from distraction and try to feel free from worries, focused on faith, living out our faith in the world and on what is important. Loving God and loving people. Amen. Amen. I skipped a page. <laughs> Standing, let us declare our faith, reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. All right, you may be seated for our announcements as we get ready. Uh, our kids are coming in one second, and when I see them, I'll let you know and run over to the piano real quick, and we'll welcome them. <laughs> so, welcome to St. George. <laughs> Thank you, Roy Thompson, for leading as a LEM this morning. We're very thankful for that. We appreciate your leadership. Yeah, applause is appropriate. Thank you. <laughs> it's not easy to get up in front of people and do that. And then a great big thank you to Taylor because that was a wonderful message, Taylor. And she's awesome. So big surprise, on the Enneagram scale, I'm a three. I'm an achiever. I don't know how that happened. So, <laughs> uh, anyways, we, we love to talk Enneagram around the office. It's a good thing to do. All right, so welcome to St. George. We're happy to have you. I realize the people online are looking at a blank screen. Hi, here we are. <laughs> so, too many jobs today. Well, we're happy to have you. So, if you're new to St. George, and we want you to go ahead and fill out a welcome card, we have a welcome card in the back of the pew. You can find it and scan the QR code that's there. Um, or you can fill it out, of course, old-fashioned. Not really, but fill it out with pen and paper and put it in the offering plate that's in the middle of the aisle. We'd love to give you some more information about St. George and connect with you. And then we have a virtual offering plate that's also offered in the back of the pew. So if you've not used this before, scan the QR code. It will take you to an electronic option to give. If you give by check or cash, we'd love to take that in the plate as well. Couple things happening right now. So, Father Ram is still on vacation. He's on for the remainder of July, but he will be back July 31st. So we look forward to seeing him then. Um, Reverend Judy is on vacation until July 21st. So we're, she's in the Northeast enjoying that time. And we are wide open and, and operating in the, in the church office, nine to one every day. If you need something, go ahead and email the staff member that you're looking for, and we'll connect with you and set up a time if you need something. On a pastoral care note, just a reminder that we have a, a big group of people who are ready to help and serve if things come up in the life, in, in your life and you need some support. Um, Father Robinson has been helping. The Kohai chaplains are helping. You can also call the church office and speak to Kristen Moen, and she's there every day with me, and so we'll get you connected to the right people. Um, the Philippians Bible study um, is continuing on. We had a, another Bible study this morning, and a big event that I'm excited about that we're looking forward to is in August, we are going to have an end of summer pool party in August. August 7th, um, Happy Wilson has graciously connected with Inwood, uh, the neighborhood pool in Inwood, and so we are going to be sending out some information for how to RSVP for this event, but we will basically do a, a church service in the morning, and then those who want to go and enjoy food and pizza, snacks and popsicles, um, and the pool, so we'll, we'll join us afterwards at the pool. So we'll give you some more information on that, but Happy Wilson will connect us for that end of year pool party. She's looking at me like, what are we talking about? <laughs> All right, if you have any questions about what's going on in the life of the parish, our eSpear, our electronic newsletter, sent out every Friday. You can find out what's going on, or you can check our website. We generally keep it up to date with the information, or contact us, we'd love to help you. All righty, our kids are here. Will you help me welcome them? Please join me in saying our offertory sentence. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy. For we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall never hope in vain. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to you, and then use us, we pray, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you and bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom through our Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We invite you to sit and enjoy this next offering as we lift up this song. A personal moment, um, this song is called Believe For It. And if you've not heard this message, um, this last year for me personally was a, was a year of challenge. Um, I lost my sister in the fall, and that was really hard. And this song happened to be on the radio a lot during that time on K-Love, on the Christian music station. And I just I challenge you to listen to this and let's listen to these messages because... We find ourselves in these moments these last couple of years where there are mountaintops or mountains that we're walking up and struggling. And so just hear this message, take it, and as we end, continue our time of worship and prayer, may this speak to you. They say this mountain can't be They say these chains will never break, but they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They have seen what you 
your prayers silently or aloud. Prayers for sickness, special needs, or concerns. Kirk, Frank. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, Today we pray for Gus and wife, Nancy, Robbie, Summer, Clay, Nan, Margie, Zoe, Efren, Carmelina, Bill, Ellen, Scylla, Heidi, Tony, Chris and Kelly, George, Vitaly, Ella, Roman, <laughs> Jimmy, Juanita and family, Gary, Orbelia, Carol, Scott, Emma, Victoria, Glenn, Ron and Joyce, Gail and John, Margaret, Martha, Mike, Rudd and Mary Ann, Clara Lynn, Barbie, and those we now name. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For those having birthdays, Ben Storan, Mike Angeloni, Cena Crawford, Mike Holmes, Efren Maldonado, Greta Sullivan, Catherine Carr, Craig Loeffler, Randall Stivers, and Diane Welch. For those having wedding anniversaries, Roberta and Arthur Aiken, we pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom.
together at the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Glory to God, whose power is working in us and do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. All right, let's join in our, our last hymn together. Will you stand and join in hymn 529? In Christ, there is no east or west. Thank you. 